Hey fellow tennis nerds and welcome to another podcast. This time I talk to my buddy Henrik Wallenstein from Sweden. We talk about rackets, we talk about his experience stringing for the Swedish Davis Cup team and uh, we talk about lots of tennis nerdy stuff. Henrik has been trading, buying, selling rackets and uh, been a tennis nerd for a long long time. He reviews rackets for Tennis Magazine in Sweden. He writes for Tennis Nerd and has created a few videos. He's also a high quality tennis player. He trains with a team that's in the first division in Sweden. So uh, he's a bona fide tennis nerd and it was a lot of fun to talk to him. I hope we can do this again and I hope you like it. If you like this podcast and want to support Tennis Nerd, check out our affiliates. You find them on tennisnerd.net. It's Tennis Warehouse, Tennis Warehouse Europe and Tennis Only and a bunch of other ones. Uh, So please consider purchasing something from our affiliates and through our links. We'll get a small commission and uh, also check out our consultation service on tennisnerd.net as well as our patreon page on patreon.com slash tennis nerd that's all for now let's dive straight into the conversation have a nice day and don't forget to play some tennis how's the situation with tennis over there in uh, in yon shopping hey, it's it's pretty okay uh, i mean we don't have any competitions any tournaments everything has been cancelled pretty much since the end of the year, um, but we are fortunate enough to, to have our tennis clubs open. Uh, most of the clubs, some clubs that are um, uh, run by the community, I think the name is, uh, they are, some are in lockdown, but our private clubs, uh, most clubs are open and um, yeah, there are really not any major impacts on our practice. We are not allowed to have to uh, practice with uh, with coaches but uh, we, we can play pretty much unlimited so yeah it, it's pretty okay we are fortunate enough to to be able to play tennis and you're playing with the the main team there Tabais Dalen yes Tabais Dalen they are um, in division one for the ladies and uh, the top division called elite Serien in in the men's side and I get to practice with with uh, that team and i mean it's huge for a amateur like me to be able to practice with such good guys uh, some or former atp players uh, college guys and the level is really really high and you improve every time you step on court with them so i'm very fortunate to be able to practice with them yeah that's rare that's that's great actually i mean the more you play with better players the 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 more fun tennis is of course so that's uh that's important so uh, what are you playing with right now with your racket choices i'm a true like you a true junkie when it comes to switching gear uh, i think i have the perfect racket and i use it for three times and then i cannot hit the court with it so but at the moment i've actually i don't know if when this is going to be be broadcast, but the new uh, or new the new paint job of the Pure Aero, the Rafa Nadal edition, I got it a couple of weeks ago from Babala to try out for um, the racket reviews of the Swedish Tennis Magazine 2021, and I've played with the Pure Aero, the first generation of the Pure Aero, um, and really liked it, but um, I had a time when I actually like the the Aero Pro better because it has a little bit more dense tighter string pattern but now this uh, this uh, new paint job actually makes the mind just spin and because it looks so good it feels like you play very good with it so right now the the pure Aero Rafa edition is my racket of choice and we'll see if I keep it for two weeks two months or yeah, not longer than two months, maybe three months. But I always change rackets. I think that it's not only a, a, a case of, of being uh, not happy with the racket's performance. It's, it's mainly that I think if you try a lot of rackets, you get bored, right? So you want to try something new. Uh, if you want a new sensation, I think that's something I realized. That even if you play pretty well with the racket and you feel quite at home, you will always look at, you know, over the fence and try to see some if there's something new that's interesting that you want to try, you know. So it's... 
it's tough to stay faithful to one racket. Yeah, I mean, um, about one and a half year ago, I was using the Yonex V Core 100, and I played my absolutely best tennis. I had, yeah, I just hit the ball very solid, and uh, I had one bad practice, one. And I changed racket. I sold them straight away. And I mean, it was just like a bad Tuesday. And I sold them. And uh, there is no reason other than just want to try something new. Uh, it's not the racket's fault. It's, I mean, I'm old, I'm lazy, I don't move my feet enough. And then I have a bad practice session and I sell the racket. So it, it's just fun to have some motivation to, to go out and practice, test something new, new strings, new shoes, new racket, new bag. Uh, new clothes, whatever. It's just fun to try new stuff. Yeah. So, uh, do you do you regret selling the Yonex now? Uh, since you play well, I mean, do you want to like buy it back then, or do you just move on? Uh, I've actually tried the uh, the new V Core 100 that was just released, and uh, I have a couple. I have like four at home of them. So, it's it's pretty much similar sensation to the pure aero i mean uh, the yonix has a little bit more dense string pattern maybe a tad more dampening the yonix has a bit more control the the bubble has a bit more power and spin i mean it, it, it's easier to create havoc for the opponent with the pure aero you just create chaos because the spin and slice is wicked with that pure arrow and with the the v core you get a little bit more control you can step on the gas a little bit more so maybe i can have them both in the bag and switch whenever i need more control or need to create more chaos for the opponents for for people who hasn't hasn't seen you play you hit pretty hard from the baseline you have a good serve you're quite a tall guy uh you're in a few of the reviews on tennis nerd you did a review with with the pure pure drive a while back so people can see you hit and uh, and you hit a big ball. I played with you once and and uh, and uh, you hit with a lot of pace. So um, so but but you usually gravitate towards uh, more uh, kind of a hundred square inch power rackets, right? That's where your go to is mainly these days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I've pretty much all my if I can call it career played with mostly rackets like Pure Drive, um, Aero Pro Drive, Pure Aero. V Core 100, uh, Head Extreme, rackets like that. And once in a while, I try like the Prestige 98 or Wilson Blade 98, rackets in that same category. And uh, when I just stand from the baseline and just hit like practice sessions grinding, uh, those 98 thin frame rackets, they work pretty well. But as soon as I play against better opponents when they are pushing me around, I just don't have the time to hit through with uh, with the thinner frames. I need some extra pace from the racket. I need some help, a little bit larger sweet spot. I mean, I'm well over 100 kilos or 0.1 tons. Uh, I think that's something around <laughs> 230 pounds or something. So I, I need to have some help because I'm not the quickest around. I'm not like Michael Chang on court, so to say. The contrasting thing is that it's so much fun to play with a control racket, but it's also a lot of fun to play with a power racket for different reasons. But like you say, in a match situation, you usually want a bit more help. And um, that's usually what people find, especially as they get a little bit older, even if they're fit, you know, and, and play a lot of tennis. You still feel like you you, you don't have the timing, um, consistent timing over a match of, of two hours to just keep playing with a with a prestige, for example. It's It's quite demanding and then you watch the tour players they can play with a 95 square inch low powered racket and hit like massive shots but it's just a different different sport for them but have you had any like arm issues with the since i'm, I'm currently suffering myself from some arm problems with all my switching and, and stuff do you feel any arm issues from the arrow or the v core or these kind of stiffer frames actually no uh i i'm always using pretty soft tension i mean i have like 20 to 21 kilos i think that's about yes let's say 45 to 47 pounds uh, with the 1.25 or 16l or 17 gauge um, polys and often soft polys as well and I always use uh, two overgrips uh, mm -hmm. that creates uh, extra dampening. So I always, when I started to play, I had grip four. Then I started to try more rackets and most test rackets was grip three. So I was using grip three. Now most test rackets are grip size two. So I'm getting used to playing with grip two and then 
uh, have one overgrip with no overlap and then one more overgrip on top of that and that creates a very soft sensation and it removes a lot of the vibration so knock on wood but i have no arm issues whatsoever from um, from the uh, the pure aero i had some actually with the, the new pure drive uh, i might have strung it a little bit too tight i was trying 24 kilos and felt some tingling sensation in the arm but with a pure aero no no nothing at all it's it's even if it's a very stiff frame i mean it's one of the stiffest out stiffest out there they have done a tremendous job with um removing a lot of the harmful vibration you still feel the ball but there is not so much vibrations coming through to the arm that creates problems for you do you think that this um this is the 2018 uh, pure aero right and uh, the banana one but it's a new paint and uh, uh, there's nothing new in this frame right that's as far as i understand no i think it's actually pretty much the same but i mean the paint job is just amazing it, it makes you it feels like you play better because it looks so good i've not seen a racket that looks better live actually it's amazing i'm looking at it now and it's like an instant crush you know you find yeah. that girl <laughs> so no I mean, no I, I, i've seen i've heard many people online that they're they're really you know taken by this frame just by the looks of it, it it's it's very rare that a racket is um is so overall liked from a paint perspective because usually people have different opinions i mean like for example the new radical some people love it some people hate it because it's so strongly polarizing in, in the paint which is a very strong paint job uh, but you rarely have like a paint that's just like everybody loves it you know it's uh, but this one looks looks pretty awesome i must say yeah it's, they have done a really tremendous job i mean it's, it's not like a secret rafa has been using it for like one year now but I think the COVID situation has made the launch been pushed back until I think it will be officially launched uh, March 11 and out in the stores March 18. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I have a difficult time to see that people will buy the, the regular yellow and black edition. It looks really, really good. It's a well done, well done Babala. And they also, I think, I mean, you, you have the rough effect. So if he plays with this, this is kind of his... Uh, um mallorca uh style paint it's, it's based on the colors uh from 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 his region so i think uh, why would people now buy the other one that he's not even using um so i think they will sell a lot of this one now and and not so much of the other one probably maybe it's going to be a limited edition or it's going to be more like this is now the new pure arrow i've heard you know? both actually yeah i've heard both i've heard some say that it's going to be a very limited limited edition so to say and some that yeah this is going to be like a normal run and um, normal racket that is unlimited supply of and so I, I actually don't know i've heard both and yeah we will see um i have ordered a couple actually already so i will play f with it especially now when we are the the winter finally is turning into spring here in Sweden in about the month time I will use it on the clay and we will see how we how we goes from there yeah that's where it should be played that should be on the clay and uh, that's where you play i mean most frequent tennis for you is you you love the clay right yeah i mean even if my game is pretty much suited i i would say maybe my i've actually had my best results on grass down in australia a long long time ago um it really suited my game with um, good serve uh, slice and going to the net and just covering with my big frame but uh, i really 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 love to play on the the red clay not the brown swedish clay that is more like gravel it's not clay it's not true clay here in sweden in most parts no. um, the the red clay is superior to play with you can slide and you have full confidence when playing on the swedish gravel it's it's more like um if you know the the gravel you have on old running tracks it's more like uh it, it looks like a gravel road it, the stones are much much bigger fraction on uh, compared to the fine powder that is clay court so it's yeah. a big difference to play on real clay I agree. I, it's tough, like like you said. I mean, the clay clay is made to to slide on, and it's supposed to be super soft. Uh, thanks to the sliding, in part, like your movement can be so smooth if you're if you know how to do it. So, 
uh, in Sweden, I was never really uh, a huge fan of, of the. It, it's a climate thing, I guess, you know. But it, it's it's uh, I, I do miss like you go down to Spain and you play on these clay courts. It's just fantastic, great yeah. feeling. The the Swedish clay. Uh, the problem is that we have, for example, now we have minus five degrees Celsius outside, mm-hmm. and uh, the ground is frozen like uh, 50 centimeters down. Um, and if you if you should start to let's say you have a couple of days with uh, plus degrees and the ground is getting soft again, if you are um, how do you say rolling the court so it's getting hard. Uh, if it's turning cold again, it it will crack and uh, turns soft. And uh, the red clay, the um, the clay courts of southern Europe, they are they are pretty much more sensitive for this kind of cold climate, so they turn soft pretty quick. So I think that's the reason why they have this uh, rougher clay in most parts uh, of Sweden. And also the season in, in Sweden is pretty short, like when you're outdoors playing tennis it's it's not that long although it sounds good if you can get started in april yeah normally we start the season about if it's not i mean if it's not sub-zero degrees we start the season around april 15 in my club Mm -hmm. Uh, but the fun thing in sweden is or it's not fun actually it's boring but when the courts are at its best in the end of august September, everyone is rushing inside because, oh, now it's indoor tournaments, indoor tennis, and it could be like 25 degrees outside in September and well over 20 in October, and the courts are just fantastic. They are really hard and easy to slide on. Then you are going inside as quick as you can and don't use the uh, the, uh, the outdoor clay courts. I mean, in Sweden, you could easily play tournaments all September in most parts of the country. So I think you should have a really longer outdoor season in Sweden and that would help our players develop even more because most of the courts indoor are pretty fast paced and it's it's one, two, three tennis. Outdoor you can play like 35 shots, but indoor it's much, much faster tennis. So I would, uh, I would uh, like, if I could, I would prevent playing indoor tennis before October 1st in most parts of Sweden. That would help the tennis really much. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said for um, playing on clay and, and playing these longer rallies that put up a bit more, you know, effort or uh, strain on your body. But it's 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 the way to improve really and become more consistent. Uh, and and playing this one, two, three tennis is not always the best way. Also for kind of lower level players to enjoy tennis because you have these very fast rallies and and you need to be faster on your feet and and react. Uh, faster so it's uh, the longer you can stay outside the, the better I, uh, in my opinion as well i think you've also traveled a bit before uh covid of course to uh, play these itf seniors tournaments uh, and I, i've been curious about those what's what's your opinion and experience with the with the itf tour for for seniors uh, it, it, it's just great i mean you have a like i tried even if i started to play tennis way 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 too late i tried somewhat down in Australia in 2001 to just give it a go and see if I could have a chance of becoming a professional tennis player. I was giving everything, practicing five, six hours every day, but I was just too far behind the the, the junior ITF players. So I was giving it up. And now when I saw that the chance is there to play international tennis, get a world ranking, but on the senior level, it's it's just so, so much fun. So I played a couple of world championships. And I mean, the fun thing with the world championship is that you can play a former ATP world number 100 or you can play a complete beginner. So you never know what you get. Uh, But the level is pretty good. And some tournaments are more local where you can have a chance against some players. Some tournaments have really, really high standard depending on the, the rating of the tournaments. But the the most fun thing is that you are always, you play like singles and doubles or singles and mixed. And you play conciliation as well. And you are on the club so much that you get to learn and talk with so much new persons around the world. And you make friends from like Poland and Russia and Spain and Germany. And you get so much contacts. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, they have also redeveloped the new systems, you don't need to pay like an annual fee. You just pay five euros, I think, extra for every ITF tournament you play, plus the normal fee. So it's not that much more expensive than playing just a normal tournament. 
and um, you get to see. I mean, you can take. Now I don't know if the what airline company are going to survive, but let's say Ryanair, for example, you can go to Mallorca Wednesday to Sunday or Thursday to Sunday and play a tournament. Um, that's maybe two days off from work, and it's cheap airline tickets uh, in off season, and you can have like a really good mini holiday or uh, long weekend, play a tournament, meet new friends, and uh, instead of maybe playing your local tournament against players you play against every week so um, it's I, I highly highly recommend going out and playing ITF tournaments and now they have also <clears throat> employed a new category they have from 30 years of age now so the year you are turning 30 you can play ITF tournaments oh, wow. before it was yeah before it was uh, 35 but now it's uh, 30 and I think the oldest is like 90 or 95 years so you can play I mean you can play pretty much your all active tennis life. The most bigger part of your tennis life, you can play ITF seniors. And I really, really, how do you say, recommend clubs that instead of having like a normal regional senior tournament, I mean, it doesn't cost that much extra to have an ITF. And it, the, um, you don't have to do so much extra compared to a normal tournament. And to have an ITF seniors tournament. So I really would uh, suggest that a lot of organizers go to the ITF um, homepage and check out the seniors and how to arrange a seniors tournament because it's it's so, so much fun. And it's something that people talk about and have, so to say, to longing for. Instead of going out and running a marathon, they have like an ITF seniors tournament to practice for. And yeah, it's it's really good motivation, really good yeah, it sounds great. I think it's it's always something I, I wanted to do. I know there's a, a bunch of them in in Marbella in Spain where I, I usually go, and um, and it seems like it's it's a social event, but it's also something for you to like you say to have a, a goal and to practice towards, and and you feel like it's a bit more serious. You have some extra motivation to put some some hours into it uh, before you go, and and it's like a mini vacation. So it sounds like a perfect thing for for players. 30 plus uh, to play these tournaments and I, I hope they do more of them and that they they stay popular yeah that would uh, it's um, so important to to keep players uh, playing our sports especially now when the um, the sport of paddle or paddle and uh, i don't know the english word for it paddle do you know the name yeah i think they call it paddle tennis but it's uh, yeah. yeah it has a different words in different languages but yeah it's been yeah. around yeah and in sweden i mean Pretty much everyone is playing in that sport now. A lot of tennis players are going into paddle, uh, unfortunately. Uh, what I hope is that it creates a new, a lot of new beginners that could not play tennis. They start to play paddle, and then when they want to develop their skills, they go over to tennis because they want something more. It's uh, I don't want to look down on that new sport, but let's say compare golf to mini golf. As long as it can help tennis, I think it makes sense. But I guess what we've seen in Sweden, especially and also in Spain, partly is that it's, it's kind of like taking over a little bit. And then you get as a tennis nerd and tennis lover, you get a bit nervous that everybody just stops playing tennis. Everybody was going to play paddle, which is not really the same thing. No, 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 it's it's not. I mean, you most of the time you play four, you play doubles in paddle and uh, here for example, in my city of Jönköping, they have built extremely much new uh, paddle um, locations. Um, they have like 40, 45 courts just oh, in wow. a 10 kilometer radius. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, everyone is playing it. Um, and it's difficult to find time. Oh, I have a paddle time uh, Wednesday, uh, half past 10 in the night and um, in the morning at five o'clock and they are, it's it's ridiculous they are selling stuff and yeah i, I really hope that the tennis can survive and still um, create an interest for players to, to stay in our sports yeah i think i mean the thing with tennis is obviously that it's uh and i guess if there's some angry paddle listeners here they will, will have to correct me but i i think tennis has more depth but it's also much more difficult to get into so you obviously need to put more hours in because the technique in tennis and footwork and and there are things that 
I mean, that's what makes a guy like me or, or you love the sport because it is kind of endless and you're, you're never, you know, fully developed and you, you keep learning all the time. And it's, it's always, uh, there's always room to improve no matter what level you're on. While paddle feels a little bit more two dimensional, but much easier than obviously to get into. And there's a social element to always playing doubles, of course, uh, that I think it, it benefits from. But uh, as, as long as it doesn't cannibalize on tennis, I think it's, it's good. I, I talked to one of my, my hitting partners. He said that in, in the Netherlands, it might have helped tennis because it's, uh, it you know, puts people together and then tennis has a place among the, the paddle courts. But in Sweden, it seems more like it's almost uh, taking over a little bit. Everybody's obsessed with this new sport. It's, uh, it's, it's what you see everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. So it's, uh, that's a bit worrying more. Everyone is talking about paddle. Everyone is uh, buying new stuff. Everyone is uh, on the television and uh, it's also much easier to uh, attract sponsors in paddle compared to tennis. And the tennis, um, the tennis society is uh, is fighting. They are struggling, but they are fighting. And um, yeah, I, I hope hopefully it will um, attract paddle players. Will choose tennis in a couple of years. But for example, in my club, since we were in this uh, region here, we had the first outdoor paddle court like four. Five years ago and since then our tennis club the tennis players has increased a lot i mean you you almost have no free times to play tennis there are almost no available times other than early mornings during the weekdays and all the groups the classes for kids and adults they are full um, and it has created a lot of interest just in the club itself so for our club i would say paddle has helped us um, but uh, there are other clubs where tennis has almost been completely washed away and they have replaced the tennis courts with paddle courts. But for our club, paddle has helped us so far. So hopefully it will stay that way. Yeah, hopefully it, it kind of makes a, kind of a unified uh, strength of, of the of tennis and like racket sports uh, so that the racket sports get stronger and no matter what it is, if it's squash, table tennis and paddle is just one of those. And it's not like something that kind of uh, eats everything else up uh, because you can make more money with it. And I think well, I mean, it's it's like everything that has a hype. And we had that poker hype. We we're, Now there's even a chess hype. I mean, I'm a, I'm a chess player, as you know, from, from way back when. So um, there's a hype for everything. So we'll, we'll see how long it, it lasts. But hopefully tennis, from what I've heard, like talking to people, uh, is that because of the pandemic, one of the positives out of the this pretty horrible pandemic is that it's it's helped tennis because it's such a social distancing sport. So more people are asking and, and wanting to start tennis. Uh, I've seen that here in, in Malta, and and I've I've heard that it's happening in other places that tennis is 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 growing a little bit in strength uh, because it's suddenly a very viable option to playing team sports, for example. Yeah, tennis has. Uh... If you should see something positive with the pandemic, I mean, it's hard to use the word positive with the pandemic, but it has helped the tennis, uh, at least here, to, to gain new uh, new players that has maybe played ice hockey that are now locked down or shut down. And their players has come and tried tennis and a lot of team sports that, that as you say, have uh, started to play tennis or try tennis. And for our sport here, Locally, the pandemic has helped gain an interest. So that's the only positive thing if you should have to find something positive with it. One thing that you did a while back that was before the pandemic, talking about that, um, that I, I thought was fascinating was that you actually went and strung. Uh, what, you were the official stringer for the Davis Cup team in their uh, tie. Against what team was it? Against? It was against Chile in the oh, okay. playoffs. So yes, it was just before the pandemic. It was uh, the first week of March last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a call on my uh, private phone when I was at work and I was clicking it because I was talking to a customer. And then I was checking up uh, who the number was belonging to and it was uh, Robin Söderling. And I was, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just clicked Robin Söderling. That's not so nice of me, but work has to come first. And I was calling him and he was asking me, do you want to string for the Davis Cup team? It's uh, the first week of March. And I had a lot of work. I was totally swamped at work. So I was just reacting and say, oh, I, I, it would be fun. But unfortunately, no, I have too much work. And then I was sitting down talking to my boss and my working friends and they were like are you crazy are you saying no to the davis cup team it's like a huge honor 
and I was calling him back and say that, oh, I'm, I actually changed my mind. I, I cannot say no to such an honor. And uh, yeah, I, I had the chance to string for the team during the entire week. Um, and it was the final match for the qualification of the, well, the, that Davis Cup got cancelled, but I mean, it's still on for November this year and we will see what's happening. But um, yeah, I had to string for the for the team the entire week. It was uh, Mikkel and Elias Ymer, Robert Lindstedt, uh, Marcus Eriksson, and um, then we have um, a backup player as well that uh, didn't uh, got the chance to play. A, a really a really good Swedish. He's not a junior anymore, but he plays for a college team. Kalle Söderlund, he was really good. He was making, uh, when he was very young, he made a, the semi-final of the Borstad Challenger. But then he went to college and uh, it will be extremely fun when to see what he can do when he uh, he's ready with college because he has, I uh, would say, at least top 200 potential in his body. Maybe even higher, maybe top 100. He has a huge game and he's extremely strong, very solid player, good nerves. So it will be very interesting to see if he will make give it a go after his college years. I think he's been five years. This is his fifth year in college, I think. Sweden has had their glory days, uh, you might think, with, with the 80s, 90s and so on. And we had Soderling obviously playing amazingly well and having a, a, a fantastic career. But now it's, it's been pretty rough for Swedish tennis. We have the Ymer brothers, but it's I don't think a, a lot of people outside Sweden know what's, what's, what else there is. But there are a few um, up-and-coming players that seem pretty strong playing futures and so on. So maybe there's some hope, you know. Yeah, hopefully. Um, but the Davis Cup week, it was very interesting. It was long hours, of course, and the, because I don't string that much uh, on a normal day basis, mostly for myself. But uh, it was long hours, maybe 20 rackets some days. And Ouch. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh. and everyone is using poly except for uh, Robert Linz that, that use uh, gut in the mains. and um, Or maybe it was a cross, I, I actually don't remember. But um, everyone is using polys and tight string patterns and uh, it's a lot of work. Chile actually had their own stringer and stringing machine brought with them all the way from Chile. Uh, oh, wow. So they are really taking... It's serious with the strings because it could be yeah, it could be such a small margins for errors and the strings are very important to to have correct in the matches. So they have high specifications on how you should string the racket if it's pre stretch or not, uh, how long before the game you should string it and um, different tensions and string during the matches etc. So it's really fun to see it on the inside how it works with the Davis Cup with the with the press conference how the players are yeah everything is it's really good to be on the on just to be with the team it's a great honor I mean I'm I would be like uh, fourth thousand four thousand reserve player if I should play myself so it's just this is the closest I will get to to uh, Davis Cup so it's a great honor to to be part of that fantastic team it was really really great fun it was extremely positive experience tennis wise it was maybe it must be the best week of my life at least my tennis life yeah it must have been amazing did you get to see any tennis or was it more like you were near the machine and <laughs> working the only action i was missing actually was uh in the fourth rubber, uh, when Mikkel Ulme went into the third set against uh, Alejandro Tabio, um, he actually saved a match point when Tabio missed the volley, uh, pretty open volley as well. And then when he was turning it around, he was giving me a racket. I want this strung in one kilo higher because it was pretty hot in the uh, Swedish Royal Tennis Hall, Kunglia Tennis Hallen. And uh, I had to run down and string it and missed the first like 14 minutes of the third set. Uh, but it was pretty much one way traffic when I was coming back. So it was really good sensation. But that was the only uh, action I was missing. So it was it was good fun to be able to be in the stands and sitting on the bench and cheering for the guys. And yeah, it was it was really nice experience. Surreal almost for an amateur player like me to be part of a Davis Cup team. Yeah, no, it it's, it was fantastic. I was really happy for you when I heard that you were, you were gonna gonna join the team. And, and but how were your fingers feeling after? Like, how many days were you stringing for? Like a whole week? Yeah, from uh, Monday to 
Saturday. I was starting oh, wow. to string on Sunday evening until Saturday when the matches was, and then the Sunday was off because it was then the game was over. But uh, so it was like seven days. Uh, the fingers was um, pretty beaten up, but some sports coach tape uh, did the trick, and yeah, it was uh, it was okay. I mean. I cannot understand how the professional stringers that strings maybe 20, 30, even sometimes 40 rackets in 24 hours, how their fingers are keeping up. But I mean, they are used to it and they are such a professional. So I'm, I'm not even close to their standard and level. And uh, yeah, my fullest respect for those professional stringers. They are amazing. They do such a great job and uh, more players should really appreciate uh, the hard work they are putting in i mean it's not it's not just to string a racket to get it good and those players that are complaining on a bad string job it's uh, they they should really know how much work they are behind each and every racket how much love and care they are doing in their trade so so my full respect for those uh, professional stringers out there 100% agree. I, I think it's uh, it's often overlooked how much work the stringers put in and, and how how much skill and experience you need to be able to understand and and uh, you know finish each string job with really high specification because the players are are super picky, right? But players on the top level they're very picky with their string jobs, so it's not it's not the easiest. <laughs> and if you get it half kilo wrong, you know someone will come back, and <laughs> it's uh, fascinating. And I, I was impressed that you you did it because I I don't think I'll manage 20 rackets in a in a day. I'll, I'll go crazy. I I think it's a lot if I have five rackets to do in a day. You, you, I, I listen to some good uh, podcasts, and uh, then the time flies. Then it's it's not so much you you don't almost you go on automatic, so to say, uh, without uh, losing any quality, of course. But um, yeah, some some something to listen to is very important when you are doing the string job. Otherwise, it will be uh, pretty tough for the brain, especially yeah. as uh, not full professional stringer. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but you're you're a good stringer, of course. You've been stringing for uh, for a long time, and it's uh, now it must have been amazing. And and they won the match, I guess. So it was uh, all all throughout positive. Yeah, we won three one. The last rubber was not played the last game, so we won three one and qualified for Mad- Madrid. And unfortunately, it got cancelled. Pretty much of a good decision when you saw the situation in the world at November, December. Uh, but yeah, we will see what happens. Uh, maybe they will have stringers on site. I don't know at, at all what's going to happen. It would, If I could get the chance to go with a team to Madrid, I would take it without no hesitation at all. It would be a, a extremely nice experience. But yeah, you have to take that. It's pretty amazing, especially if there are like, uh, you know, other teams and other players there. It's always so nice to go to a live tennis tournament. It's just uh, amazing, especially if you're behind the scenes a little bit. So you string obviously for yourself all the time mainly. Um, what, what are your like favorite kind of go-to strings? What do you put in the pure arrow now that you're playing with? Always when I try a new frame, I always use the Head Hawk Touch 125. That's uh, not because I like the string the most. Just uh, it's a really good go-to string, so to say. That's the string I'm most used to when I'm trying s- strings. I mean, I cannot try. One string with uh, RPM Blast and the next racket with uh, Hawk Touch and the third with VS Gut because it makes such a different sensation. So my go-to string when I'm trying rackets is the Hawk Touch. When I'm when I'm going out to compete, I would say that Solinko Torbite 120 in a tighter pattern or 125 in a 6019 pattern is my is my tournament string. That's a really good bite and uh, good control the next string i've cut out now to the pure error that i will try is the msv focus hex 127 because it's uh, the pure error is very open 69 in string pattern so it's really eating strings for me and then the 127 will help to save some string life um, and i will try it i've not tried it in the pure error so far uh, but i will try it uh, i also like the the rpm blast in the pure error it's a good combination that's mostly used strings that i have but i also try a lot of signum pro polyplasma that's maybe the most uh, price if you're considering a price performance ratio the polyplasma is maybe the best string on the market right now Mm-hmm. Um, and I also have a couple of reels of Luxelon Power at home that's good to use when you want to 
have a little bit more of a luxurious feel. It's a, the all the power is it's one of a kind. It's a different sensation in that string. It's it cannot be compared to anything else. I think if it's a better or worse string than other strings, um, that's in the eye of the the player. But um, it it sure is a unique string. The all the power it go, it gives you a special sensation. It feels like you have both power and control at the same time but in a racket like the pure arrow i don't like the the all the power at all it's um, it creates too much live uh, life um, so it's difficult to keep the ball under control then i want uh, like an even more dead poly in those kind of uh, rackets yeah i agree i think the all the power it's one of my favorites uh, either to do a hybrid uh, with like an nxt or a natural gut or something or if you're doing it in a full bed, it's it's pretty nice in like a Blade 98, for example, at a low tension. But it's not something I'd put into a Clash or a 100 square inch uh, 6019 racket because it's it would, you know, like you say, it would be a bit too much. And I think it's, it won't last as long there. Uh, but it's really nice in tighter patterns. Yeah, uh, yeah I, it's, uh, I mean, if you have like example, a Wilson Blade 98 and use the all the power, it's um, if the blade wouldn't be so demanding in a, in the long run that would be my racket of choice uh, actually I, I really like the blade 98 the, the v7 version mm-hmm. uh, pretty strange is that i like the 1820 version much more than the 1619 version i i don't know why um, but it's it just feels better very solid but it has a really high swing weight they should have made a swing weight lower for the blade 98 i mean they could have maybe 320 325 strong swing weight but now it's like 335 and that's too much actually for most uh, amateur players it's really really heavy so i hope when the new version comes out that maybe they are lowering the swing weight a fraction so more players can use it in the long run i also think that kind of i agree in a way because it also gives them the player more room for any customization if you're up to 335 uh, with strings, you have no room unless you're a really solid player and want uh, like a 350 st- swing weight. You don't have much room to play around with the specs. So, um, and it's also like if it's if it's poor in quality control, you might get 340 and then you're 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 gone, right? So it's uh, it's it's always when you're in the high. Uh, that's that's the thing with when when you have a quality control issue, when when the the rackets sometimes are are in a really high swing weight range, 330 plus strong just a little bit more weight in the head uh, than what it should be it, and then the racket is, is becoming kind of difficult to use for most players i i don't think that's a smart uh, unless you can promise the quality to be a hundred percent it's not going to be easy to to sell that racket effectively right very true i've just been playing with the blade 98 1820 and i agree with you it is does feel more solid than the 1619 so i think i like the 1820 better and uh, it's somewhat demanding, but it's it's quite nice. I, I use it now with the full bed of natural gut to save my arm a little bit. And it's actually a really nice playing racket, even with the full bed of gut. You don't get the, so much spin, but you're getting a really nice feel and, and good control as well. It's interesting when you say that uh, with the arm problems. Uh, I had, um, it could be maybe 15 years ago or something, I had severe arm problem. I mean, it came to the point that I had to stop playing for a long time. When I was uh, starting again, uh, I bought the, the Pro Kenex 5G racket and strung it with the uh, uh, Isospeed uh, professional string, the old Thomas Muster string. Yeah, yeah. And that's pre, pre-coiled to 40 kilos, pre-tension, pre-stretched. Uh, and that saved my arm. It was like uh, velvet for the arm. It's uh, so, so, so smooth and no vibration at all. The kinetic system really, really works. So if someone has a major arm problem, the go-to from, from my side is uh, Pro Kinex, uh, with the kinetic system and uh, the ease of speed professional string. That's the best string for arm problems that's really out there. It's uh, Of course, gut is uh, also a good option, but uh, the ease of speed costs like one fifth of the, the gut. So um, that's a, a good option if you're having severe arm problems. There are too many players playing with um, stiff polyesters at high, at high tensions. 
And that's what I see all the time that players come in and they do a consultation or they complain about something and it's it's generally like a problem with the tension being too high. And uh, I mean, it's you, you see that a lot when, when people buying, when they're buying new rackets, maybe they're not so well read on tennis specs and strings and so on. And they go to their local club shop or, or something and then they you know they just sell them a racket they don't think so much maybe what would be good for this player or if he's going to get an arm issue or so so and and they just get their like pure arrow strung with 25 26 kilo rpm blast 130 gauge and that's good for rafa perhaps but it's not so so good for a lot of rec- recreational players out there no absolutely not i mean i always always when i string in, it's not so often anymore but if some friends or other players are coming and want me to string a racket for them i always uh, try to get them to play with the the lowest possible tension um instead of having 25 kilos i mean try one time to see how you play with 21 kilos see how you react see if there is any positive sides that you have maybe not uh, thought about in the past so my recommendation is always to string the racket as loose as possible and uh, at least try it once and see how you go give it not just one session give it a couple of sessions and see how it feels and that's a good recommendation because there is so many players that still believe that you need to string a racket in 26 27 kilos and you don't need to do that at all these days with the police no no they're not made for that kind of tension that's that's fine if you're using gut or or a multi-filament string but it's not going to be good for a polyester string i find the the poly really works best and, and it's when it's at a low tension it seems like it's more lively it feels better it's it's everything seems more natural absolutely the the sweet spot gets much much bigger when you're using a lower tension and uh, yeah, everything, you, you get more uh, spin, you get more speed, you get more comfort, uh, touch, everything. It's just control that is maybe a little bit lacking, but the poly strings is in their selves so good control in most cases. So you, you don't need to have the tension to have the control. Yeah, you have to spin to win, so to say. Yeah, they're made for for kind of spin players anyway. So if you're maybe if you're a flat hitter, you can consider going a multi-filament and okay to go a little bit higher tension because you're hitting it flat. You don't need a lot of spin. But players who hit with some spin, they they would probably be be happy with a poly at a re- pretty low tension. Absolutely. And, and and you're seeing that also on tour, like the the average tensions are dropping below 50 now, even the top hundred. So it's yeah, it's definitely changing. Uh, a little bit, although there are players like Dustin Brown who still <laughs> use uh, 70 pounds or, or like 30 plus kilos on his uh, yeah. on his rackets, which is which is pretty weird. Is there anything you're missing in the in the racket industry? I mean, you've been reviewing rackets for for quite a long time. You've been trading rackets. That's how we got to know each other. Trading <clears> rackets on on for tennis warehouse forums and and uh, and string forum and and these kind of places. Um, but is there anything you're, you're, you're not seeing in the racket industry or racket market that you would like to see? Not really. Um, the rackets these days are actually pretty good. I mean, if we are looking back maybe 10 years, the racket was a lot more, even if the flex was not stiffer than maybe now, uh, the, the, um, the rackets felt much more stiff, more harmful to the arms. Now the racket companies has focused more on lowering the flex making it more um, better dampening and uh, they are focusing on uh, saving people's arms they have really been listening they have also been doing some reissues i mean head was listening to the everyone who demanded the pro tour uh, to come back and they have listened to them uh, prince has uh, relaunched some classic names at least and also the um, new rackets with the amazing uh, dampening technologies uh, seems like the companies are really listening to the players and giving them what they want wilson has the uh, the ultra pro now for example and blade pro that was really much demanding and had huge prices on the black market when it comes to pro stock so I, i'm not really missing anything the the only the only frame i'm uh, if i should like Okay, you, you can do whatever you want in the racket market. I would uh, ask Babala pretty much on my bare knees to create like a pure arrow classic or pure arrow control, the, um, which would be the Aero Pro drive string pattern. The little bit, the, the still 60 19, but a bit tighter string pattern because the center spacing 
is pretty big on the current Purero. So if I should, if I could design a racket, it would be like the current Pure Aero with the tighter 6019 string pattern, or the old Aero Pro string pattern would be perfect. That's the only wish I would have right now for the racket industry if I could choose completely free. I think that's a good uh, good wish. I, I would uh, second that. I think the uh, the best uh, Aero Pro or Pure Aero I I play with was the original because of that. It has a kind of diff, slightly different feel. It's a little bit more raw. Uh, I wouldn't say it's harsh, but it's a bit raw. There's no dampening really going on there. Uh, but the, the string pattern is is all, almost like optimal for a, a 100 square inch racket. As long as you hit in the sweet spot, you have max control for that kind of frame. Uh, but it's still pretty forgiving. Sometimes with these 100 square inch 1619 patterns, I think the center is too open. And, and uh, that's something Dunlop does a pretty good job. The, the frames feel a bit different, but... They, they do a good job that they, they always, the center is pretty tight and that uh, helps uh, for control, I think, a lot. So uh, that's something they could uh, they could work on. Absolutely. I mean, uh, power is nothing without control. And if you have too much power, um, you could have some control issues. I mean, if you look at, for example, the head extreme, the racket itself is amazing. It's uh, very good power, very good spin. But uh, the, the current Extreme 360 Plus from Head, it also has pretty wide string uh, holes, so to say, spacing in the center. Um, if you look at the Extreme Pro, it has a bit tighter string pattern, almost like the Instinct. It's a bit, it's still 6019, but tighter in the, in the center. And it gives just the perfect blend of power and control. So, um, yeah, yeah, they they should not be too open or at least have like pure aero spin and pure aero control, for example. I think that would really help them to sell a lot of extra rackets because it could help the the players to choose. Um, It's the same balance, same specs, so to say, but just a bit more control or a bit more spin. That would be really interesting if they uh, launched something like that. Yeah, I think that could could be a... A great idea. Sometimes in the racket market, one of the things people struggle with, and we all do, I think, is that the the, the naming is is a problem always, and and the because uh, they're long names and they don't mean a lot, and uh, also there's so many models, so you don't know. Most players have no idea what to choose from, right? So, but if you were smart with the naming, I think Babla was always pretty good in the way that they only have like three lines of rackets. Pure strike for more like aggressive players who who like to hit hard and go for winners and and with more precision, and pure drive a little bit more forgiving, uh, more baseline aggression, and then you have arrow for for spin players, but. You could have, like like you said, aero control with maybe a, a slightly softer feel, more tight string bed. And then you have the aero, more kind of spin monster frame. And then that would be, uh, that would also like give the players like a clear idea. Who is this for? Like, what do you want from this frame? It's a pretty forgiving frame, but then you get more control in this one. You get more power, for example, yeah. slash bin. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that gets more confusing because I mean, you have no idea like what's the power level compared to this and this, and and one of the the most frequent questions I get is that, can you compare X Y Z frames? And uh, it takes a long time to compare, and it's not always easy to compare frames all the time. And even, I mean, like head, they have a lot of rackets, for example. So that's uh, that can be quite difficult to compare. Like what's a uh, the Prestige S versus the Speed MP? They're pretty close in specs. What's the difference yeah. there? Yeah, head has, uh, uh, for example, head. They have so much different models now. I mean, the instinct and the extreme borderline. If they need both, I would say uh, they are so close. Yeah, it's it's uh, some rackets has uh, too much to choose from, and at that point, Babala has done a great job with minimizing the models. But they could have some more choices within the lines, so to say. Um, yeah. It's uh, yeah. It would be interesting to see and listen to the strategies of the different companies, what they are thinking about when they are uh, launching new lines and rackets. Exactly. I think uh, if you have, for example, fewer lines, let's say you have pure strike, <clears throat> pure drive, pure aero, and then you have one model or one to two models within that family of rackets that is kind of more flexible, more control oriented, because that would be like instead of the pure control line, which they used to have. And I I kind of miss pure control because that was a very good uh, line of rackets, in my opinion. So and used to have pure storm is before the strike. It was it was they were they had more more lines and now they have less. So that's good. But they might want to have a few more flexible options or more control oriented options as well. 
Yeah, I fully agree. So we hope that Babala is listening to this and taking up on the drawing boards. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Do you have any rackets you're looking forward to trying uh, soon? At the moment, I'm happy with the Aero. Uh, I've just got a couple of Blade 98S version that I will try. It's a lower swing weight in those rackets. They have like 317 strung or something like that. Uh, I will try that out. Um, I've actually got the Burn 100 I will try. Some new interesting frame from Dunlop. I know you have tried it. It's called uh, the... Uh, the CX200. I've just tried it a couple of times, and it's so far it's a surprisingly good feel, actually. Um, yeah, it's nice, that one. Yeah, it's Go good. On. Good. It's um, a good, uh, t- almost like a tweener racket, but with good control and good, um, and good power and spin. It's it's um, surprise of the year almost that frame. So they have done a good job. That's the racket I'm trying right now. And apart from that, I have nothing more coming in at the moment. What, was it the CX200 or the CX400 Tour? Uh, CX200. Okay, the, red the and 98. Black, uh, yes, the red and black version. Because I, I think you would like, and I really like this one, uh, the, the 400 Tour. That was my big... I mean, I like the 200 as well because that was, was pretty much in the middle. But the 400 Tour was 100 square inch with a lower stiffness and a tight string bed. It was actually yeah. quite an interesting frame. Could be nice to try that one as well. Yeah, yeah, I was, uh, that was a surprise to me because uh, the, the problem, I mean, always hitting with a racket like the 200 Tour that's very demanding, like 95 square inch, 1820 or 1619 pattern. It's nice to hit with, but as soon as you get into match mode with, with against good players, you, you, you miss the power, you know, and then you want something extra. But players that have big strokes that, that can that play serious tournaments, you, you need any kind of assistance you can get. So uh, those frames then become quite difficult to use although there's there's super nice just like playing around with or practicing with them all right so we're almost close to one hour here i i've it's been uh, <laughs> it has been we can probably talk for like three more hours yeah uh, hopefully we can uh, hopefully we will have more chats in the future and hopefully when the pandemic is over we will meet down in marbella and review some rackets live instead Last thing I, I thought of, of asking you is that when you, you always kind of customize your frames or you like kind of buying low spec, do you always add silicone and then like lead tape? I mean, you did a post for Tennis Nerd that I can really recommend to players who are into kind of customization where you had some good tips and, and, and visuals of how you do it. But is, is that something you regularly do with your rackets? Yeah, uh, I have to apologize for that post that I did for Tennis Nerd because that was... Uh, before I was um, so aware of the swing weight importance. Now I have the head three in one machine. And if you are reading that old post, you have to take in mind that I was not so much aware of the swing weight at that time. So now I'm, I mean, I'm, it was like a totally new world for me when I was starting to mess around with the swing weight. So I always try to custom once with silicone just to get a little bit more damp and feel not much maybe four to seven grams of silicone and then just a little bit lead to on the sides at three and nine to make is the racket uh, the same specs so if i have like four rackets i want them to be exactly the same specs with swing weight and weight and static weight a couple of years ago i was adding maybe 30 grams of lead but now i can add maybe four or five grams of lead and be satisfied because i've I'm not playing with that high static weight anymore. Before it was like 330 unstrung. Now I have maybe 310, 315 unstrung at maximum and always use about the same swing weight between 325 and 330 strung swing weight and maybe a weight of 310 to 315 unstrung and a balance of around 31 and a half to 32. That's my, my go-to specs, so to say. Yeah, and that's a pretty user-friendly spec as well. I, I think you see many kind of tennis nerds that they slap on too much. I mean, we've all done that. I think everybody has, has done that at a period in their in their tennis life, that they started adding too much weight to the frame. Like you're adding 3 and 9, then you add 12, and uh, counterbalance in the handle and so on, and it, it just gets too much. Now you can actually play well with lower swing weights and you see even on the pro tour that swing weights are definitely going down for most players and then you see racket head speed going up mm. and uh, swing weight going down that's a good uh, good way to go actually because high swing weight is uh, it's tiring in the long run so to say if you're an older player and have high swing weight it's it's really demanding for your arms and bodies in the long run 
All right. So that's great. So I th- really want to thank you for your time. I know you're a busy guy, and uh, but I hope we can do this this more. Maybe when there are some new rackets uh, coming into the market, we can discuss from your point of view and and from my point of view. Since you 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 try pretty much everything new, interesting that comes in. Absolutely. We will sure keep in contact. Thanks a lot. No problem. Have a nice day. Same to you, man. Thank you.